ethnic cleansing and clashes, which led to targeting of the Tutsi population. But the thing was that the Tutsi spread. Some of them went to Uganda, others went to Burundi. So the leadership of Hutus who tried to dispel them knew very well that well, if they, they have to be mindful of the other <coughs> Tutsi group from neighboring countries who would come and, you know, uh, and aid um, the, the minorities over there. But by 1994, the problem was growing, and if you listen to the beginning of the documentary, the, the movie that we, we, we showed, it made reference to ongoing kind of mediation. You know, didn't finish yet, but nevertheless, the problem was just mounting. <coughs> so, by April 1994, fortunately, the situation kind of culminated into the situation that it became. And again, to put it back to the way we start, the world reaction was impinged by these media representations that Africa is a place, you know, where you could say, you know, not just disease, despair, but Africa has known nothing other than tribal warfare. And if it is tribal warfare, then it is just one of the many of tribal warfare that plague the country. If so, why should we, you know, really hasten to intervene in a manner that, you know, the Western nation did in Yugoslavia and in uh, other places? So I, I I like to leave it now here and then open the floor for some kind of back and forth that where we can discuss questions and comments that you may have. <coughs> Obviously, when I, I think of Rwanda, I don't think of any major exports that are feeding the key UN countries, the US, England, that type of stuff. How much of the fact that there's no economic interest in this country supplied this fact that the UN was just going to ignore it? Because obviously, if something like this was happening in the Middle East mm -hmm. with oil, there's automatic interest in it. Mm -hmm. But here, with no major exports, it, it seems like not only is it the tribal warfare and everything going on, so forget it, but there's no dollars involved, which is sick to think about, but I, how much do you think that influenced Absolutely. the Absolutely. I mean, their uh, economic things, lack of economic incentive did not help the situation uh, at all. And you could compare that to other areas, but I mean, the whole thing goes back to the concept of Africa, the media presentation. So much damage to anything that is African that is very hard. It has been very hard for international community uh, to respond. The other issue had to do with legacy of colonialism. Who created the situation? So, would you think Africans failed, the Tutsi and Hutus failed to understand each other? Or do you think? The colonial legacy that we describe has something more to do with the creation of this problem. Which do you think? Colonial, because who were the Bel Belgians to pick their own, to pick the chiefs? Like, if it wasn't like that when you got there, you shouldn't change it. It's not your land, so you can't make it your own, mm -hmm. you know? So. Absolutely. That's one point. That's one valuable point. I mean, this were not their land, and plus their knowledge of the group relations was also very limited. Mm -hmm. And if you take this point and look at the same practice that the colonial administration pursued in the Congo, what has been the result? Similar. Congo, there have been an effort also to declare Congo saw the longest warfare from, you know, the beginning when the belt, the same belt, again, kind of lacked, empowered, 
I mean, one section and other section that was kind of more involved in international effort, you see the same ethnic split that caused a prolonged war that goes back from the late 1950s, continue until today. And if they did not handpick, probably the situation might not have been the same. <coughs> I mentioned Biafra. We are lucky that Nigeria at least did one thing ever kind of you know good in its history, and that was appealing to common sense and getting to a point where they, whereby they stopped and said, "Wow, you know, we are all one nation. The Igbos, the Yorubas, the Hausas. Although we do not create the concept of Nigeria, we have to leave and deal with it." But if you move from this area, you go to Kenya, till now, ethnic divisions continue to hamper uh, a lot of progress. In Sudan, people could not leave together. And again, it goes back to this colonial infrastructure and creation of uh, you know, these tensions, etc. So that is one I mean view. What else do you think? Well, the problem I, I see besides just the cultural aspects is that the British have problems where they, before they, the Belgians take over, um, the British have a, a way of, they create a rigidity in any system they encounter. I don't know if it's because they like this as an aspect of British's own culture, but it seems like in other places that they colonized or took over, they tend to make the system more rigid. India, for example, and other experiences in Southeast Asia, there's also a more rigidity. So I think their their influence in Africa also, like their the very idea of race in it itself, I think also creates a rigidity where these people are probably very much similar, probably by language. So. Yeah, the, the, their language was very similar. So but by creating that rigidity, I mm -hmm. think they cause more problems, even if you don't want to lay like, the responsibility of people's mm -hmm. future actions on them. Mm -hmm. I think you can start at that point mm -hmm. from there as far as mm -hmm. like, what the issue. Yeah. The other thing we need to realize about Africa is that Africa is one of the most diverse I mean, place uh, of all the continent that we have. So whether you talk of physical geography, Demography of people, you, know, you find all different types of people and they are indigenous to your continent. So not knowing this and making the distinctions rigid to the point that they have been essentialized only leads to these problems that Africa suffer in post-colonial uh, world. And unfortunately, until we overcome the misconceptions that have been created about the continent and appreciate you know, the root cause of these, including colonialism that we talked about, is going to be very hard to overcome these issues. Good, any other question? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of world leaders um, express remorse afterwards and um, I've heard that Bill Clinton um, is working in Rwanda today. Um, has there been any backslides since the Rwandan incident? Yeah, um, Bill Clinton and the former uh, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, they have both you know, expressed remorse. Uh, the Canadian General, General uh, Romeo Diller, wrote the book and he couldn't sleep for a number of years because you know he felt that he was the you know the UN uh, you know the head of the UN uh, peacekeeping in Rwanda and for a number of years he just couldn't sleep and it all goes back to that. And there have been a lot of efforts to bring reconciliation but a lot of these efforts also are internal because in Rwanda today there are what is known as the Gachacha. Uh, court. The Kachacha courts bring, you know, 
to see Hutus, perpetrators, victims together to address, I mean, these issues. You know, issues of forgiveness, how to move forward. Because, you know, if you look at the game, the radio, in the radio, the way they were preaching and saying things about, you know, other, especially the Tutsi, it was horrible. It get to a point whereby they say, well, anyone should not marry or intermarry Hutus with Tutsi. Because if you marry Tutsi, this is what ultimately is going to, you know, to happen. And so they did everything that they could do in order to exterminate you know, in its eyes. And that was, these were some of the reasons why the world has to read, you know, based on these evidence, accept that yes, the Rwandan crisis was in fact a genocide because there was this deliberate intent in order to wipe out and eliminate uh, a whole uh, group of people. Oh, um, I just had a question about, at one point did the genocide end? Was it, um, did like the Tutsi rebel? Was it from eventual UN intervention or international outcry? I'm just not sure what. What stopped it was Rwanda, uh, Tutsis from Burundi and Uganda. There, they have, I think in Uganda they have about 12% and here to they have about 14%. So Tutsi forces began to coalesce and move in. So, and you know, and, and, and that's part of the, so they created this rebellion or the rebel movement, and the rebel movement were able to go in, and um, there were, in fact, uh, the first respondent. International forces didn't really do much. It was really after the fact. Yeah. And today they're still, I mean, they have power again because it's very, very strong they have to. So they did really, you know, respond uh, by themselves and save their own kind. So the to see your power today, or is it like a mix? It's a mix, sorry. Oh. It's a mix. I should say, I should say it's a mix. Yeah. Okay. Because we are the only one that they, you know, they got help from the government. And okay. because of that, this area that is known as the Great Lake area, mm -hmm. that is persistent crisis there. And it's a place where anything that is happening here is very easy to detect or point finger that, oh, Uganda is behind it, or Burundi is behind it, because in reality that's real politics, that they have to form this kind of alliances among themselves, even though the international you know, pressure implies that Uganda should not interfere in Rwanda. Like there are uh, rebel groups that crisscross, because you know, uh, that's where they kind of tap and derive resources. Yeah. Any other question, comment? Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you guys for coming. I hope you see, see you at one of our um, other meetings. We uh, every Wednesday at 5 in uh, this room. So thank you.